Δημήτρια. Okay. Ναι, ναι, φυσικά. Οκ, okay, I'll um, switch to English because we may have some, uh, some uh, attendants uh, that are English speakers. It is a great honor to have with us today Professor Lia Thanasoula. Lia got her BSc in physics from the University of Athens, I think, and her PhD from the University of Thessaloniki, and then a doctorate d'etat from the University of uh, Franche Comte in 1978. Uh, she worked uh, as a researcher at the Besançon Astronomical Observatory and at ESO, at the European Southern Observatory, before joining the Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Marseille, where she at the uh, Ex-Marseille University, where she's been uh, uh, since then. Um, she's now a professor emeritus, I think. Uh, she, um, the, the Academy of Athens gave uh, Lia the Fortinos Prize in 2005, and she was elected as a corresponding member of the Academy of Athens, that is, uh, a few years back in 2020. In 2011, she won the Brower Award of the American Astronomical Society, and in 2020, she was elected as a legacy fellow of the American Astronomical Society. And I believe that since 2017, uh, she's a board member of the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, uh, Professor Thanasule is a world-renowned dynamicist, distinguished for her work in numerical dynamics of disk galaxies. She studies the dynamics, chemodynamics, and structure and evolution of disk galaxies, and has focused on substructures such as bars, spirals, rings, or bulges. Um, her interests include studies of uh, orbital structure theory and chaos, uh, as well as of the nature and distribution of dark matter. She has extensively used um, hydrant and body simulations uh, for this type of studies, and um, not only for single galaxies, but also for um, uh, interacting galaxies and mergers of galaxies. Um, so we are very looking forward to your talk today, Leah. Welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this so nice introduction, and uh, thank you really for everything, for inviting me, first of all, to give this talk. Um, now, wait a minute, I have to get this working first. Right, and... This would be, oh, I guess, this one. Yep. Yep. And now um, let's make it full screen. Right. So um, I'm not going to talk much about orbits today. I'm going to talk mainly about something which is the in, a, in the galaxy, the main component, one of the main components rather, sorry. The main component is always the disc and the halo. And then there is bars. Bars are really um, a very important part because they, on them relies the galaxy evolution. And the best way to work with them is to use simulations because one can use simulations from many different points of view and see things differently. And then you try it again and then it doesn't go still and so on and so forth. Now, let me, um, I, I have been asked to, make a few minutes in the beginning with um, with where we will go slower. Now, if you think I am too slow, that is, you already know all that and yet more, please say so. In, on the other hand, if you think that I'm going too fast, that perhaps also let me know. So let me start by um, looking at galaxies and particularly looking at the tuning fork of Hubble. So Hubble wanted to classify galaxies and he did the following uh, plot, which, well, it's not really his, this one, but it is following the, the same, the work that um, Hubble had. And we have here the elliptical galaxies, which do not have a disk. And we have here the disk galaxies, which do have a disk. So there is a big, big difference between these two types of galaxies. 
Now here the disks are again split to two. We have disks, disk galaxies which do not have, which do not have bars and disk galaxies which do have bars. And you can see that here, you can see a number of picture on them and a number of picture of, of the galaxies which don't have bars, but have nice spirals, for example, this one. There is no, we, it's just one hour, so there's no time really to talk about all of them. And anyway, one has first to understand the most important of all the components after the main components of the halo in the disk, and that is the bar. If we don't understand that, we'll not be able to understand things like the spirals, which do something to the evolution, but which is very, very little compared to what the bar does. So here's a nice barred galaxy. The bar is this thing. I don't know, can you see my, um, my cursor? Yes. Yeah. Good. So the bar comes roughly to here goes down here, 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 and here. So it is interesting to see that this is a central part, which is thicker than this part. And here we have the, the other piece of the bar and the other piece of the bar. And these are thinner. And then we look at it again and see that there is the spirals here. We say the several spirals. And we see there's a lot of star formation in different parts. Now, there is another thing which actually fascinated me. Um, uh, let me first say that the bars for me, st what started fascinating me was simply bars. I loved it. I, I, I really loved them. And then the next step in this thing is these lines. Look at this here. Duck. And then straight, nearly straight, this one. So what is this? This one, I, I spent quite some time trying to understand myself and then, you know, reading, of course, and so on and so forth. That was even before my thesis that I wanted to have a look at this kind of, um, this kind of things. So what are they? Well, from the fact that they have this color, I can see that they are, oh, they are made of either gas and or dust. Okay, let's see another one. Ah, this is the same one. This is this galaxy. We see this part. It is, and, and you see 1300 actually. And this is the same galaxy, except that I go further out. And so I, I integrate the light for longer so that we see what's going further out. You see the other one, we stopped here, right? This one, we continue, we go along and we come here. And it is very, very, uh, low density material, but still it is quite interesting. This is also 1300, we said. Now let's forget about, it. ah, this one's amusing. This also is, has the same thing. Remember the other one, the first one we saw, 1300. It had an initial part and then there was a bar, the two pieces of the bar, and then there's a ring here. This one is this kind of, so you see that this is a like the previous one, but it is a very non, uh, it's non asymmetric. It's symmetric into, into a kind of a circle. And we have the two thin parts of the bar here and here. Now let's look at this fellow here. This is 1365. It also has an initial bar in the center, right? There's spirals, spirals here, there's pieces of spirals falling back. And look at this one now in here. We see the same lines which had so much taken my time and thought and everything. And this thing though, this time though, they have a different shape. They look like they're curved. Remember the previous ones, they were pretty straight here. And here, they are not, there's this thing. So what is those things? These things turned out, as I said, to be dust and gas. And I classified them, um, actually it's not in 92, it was even before as 1980 something, I don't know. 
And I found three different types. There is the totally straight ones. Remember, we saw one in the beginning. Then there are those where it isn't straight at all. It's, it's like this. And then the other ones, which sort of reconcile a little bit those two, where there is straight, 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 and then they go around. And this is the center of the galaxy in the center here. So I wanted to know how this worked. And this thing was possible. For, it was possible for me to do it because of the, the computers were able at that time to do hydrodynamics. So it's a sort of, that's a lot of work in here, but we can see that there is, here's the center, the center of the galaxy is here, here and here. And you see here that is like this and like this. So this one would be actually 1300 because it comes like this and like this and like this. And if this one was curved like we had it there, then it would be 1365. So what I did was to start with a simple square, two dimensions. I couldn't afford three dimensions. So I started with a square and put gas on it and put it on a circular motion around the center of the galaxy. And the galaxy was composed of a disk, a halo, and a bar. The bar I have not plotted on these three plots, nor on any of the others here, basically because it would take all the attention and I don't want to show the bar. I want to show the results of the bar. I want to show what the bar does to the, to the gas. So here's the center and what the bar itself goes roughly from here. I don't know which one of the two you see, but I mean, it's, it's this one and then here. The bar, the major axis of the bar goes like this. It goes through the center. We have here these dust lanes, which here are gas lanes. And the motions of the gas is shown here. So there it was actually when I came to France that I was able to do those things because even though I made an incredibly hard, um, approximation, and that is that the gas is not a major component. So the disk and the halo have most of the mass, and the bar will have quite a bit of the mass, but the, not the gas. So what I will do is forget that the gas has mass, and I will look at what, how the gas responds to the, to the bar. So in fact, it's a simplified approach, but even so, this thing, every single one of you see here, this is a different bar here, here, and here. Every single one of those took two nights, so 12 hours of CPU in the biggest computer in Marseille. And to do this, I had to do it twice. I had to calculate first the outer part, the whole part, and then zoom in the central part and look again. So with all that, I had about a hundred different bar models and I was patient. I was interested, so I was patient and I went and I waited and I saw how, what could happen with all those hundred models. So here I, I have three models. And these three models will tell me one thing, and that is how fast does the bar rotate? What is the pattern speed of the bar? The angular velocity of the bar, we call the pattern speed of the bar. And the idea is that this is something you cannot measure in, with observations because it's, it goes so slowly that it's way beyond the life of a person. And so how do we do it? Well, we just, I just uh, made those simulations, measured the thing on the simulation, and then looked at the shape of the dust lane. 
So you will look at this thing. The dust lane is here, and that is very near the dust lanes we had in the um, in the previous pictures we, I showed you. Then look at this fellow here. This fellow has indeed this kind of things, but there is a, it doesn't have it doesn't always look like that. It goes inside and then there is a straight line. It's as if you had hit it here. You got a cut here. That is something that has never been observed. And therefore this, this, um, this model is very interesting because it tells me that it is not realistic. Since this thing is never seen, it means that the model is not realistic. Now this one we saw is realistic, and this one also is not the kind of stuff that we see. I showed you a few pictures only because there is no time, but this kind of thing you don't see much, and this kind of thing you certainly don't see at all. These three models are identical except for one thing, and that is the pattern speed of the bar, how fast the bar rotates, how fast the bar rotates. And from saying this cannot be, this most probably cannot be, and this looks pretty good, I take the limiting values of these things and say, ha, huh, now I know what the pattern speed will be. Now that was a very important point because it had not been done. So before my um, calculations there were done, it had not been done. And in particular, I could even put a bracket. So it doesn't go to this side, it doesn't go to this side, and I can put it somewhere between this and this. And therefore I can say something about a number of galaxies and a number of bracketings. Now here there's a bit of a little graphics to show how this goes. This little thing makes it more clear here there. And this is another um, thing where I am going to look not at the pattern speed anymore. I pretend I understood everything about it. And here I will show five different models, identical in everything except one thing. And that one thing here is the actual ratio of the bar. Here is the bar, the outline of the bar. And we see that here the bar is very thin. And here the bar is like an oval, really. It's a thick thing. So we, if the bar is thin, it is possible to say that is stronger than the, the, this bar is the strongest bar because all the mass, because the mass is the same on all the bars, but here I've, I've put it all together into something which is elongated and therefore the force and the, and the, uh, the torque of the bar are quite strong, very, very strong. A result, this also is not very good. And this is not very strong, but this is very nice. And again, I can say, oh, I can say the, uh, this I would not call a bar. So there are things like that. They're ovals, but they're not the bar. And actual ratio five is a little bit too much. Three starts being okay again. So I played this game again and again and again. And with my hundred models, I managed to put parentheses onto this kind of bracketing of all this kind of stuff. Now, again, you will see that here, it was this straight line, here was this line. And therefore, for example, if you look at this one, it is the same, in, of the same kind rather as this one. And the other one was the straight one, and it was in these things. Okay, so now with very little, we managed to see a very large number of things because we understand a lot about all those all those um, galaxy, all those discs of gas. And we live in a, in a blessed time in a way, because 
not only do computers go much faster than the computers that I took to, to do those kind of calculations where I had to stay nights and nights and nights, but also observations are much better, much they can have a better limits, they can do, they can go deeper, they can all sorts of things. And so we can actually, and we have two new things coming. One is come, well, they're both there actually, JWST and Alma are just about there, but they are they are such as as to give us new data. And that we can see easily here. This is the same galaxy. It's it's by not by accident that I always show you the same galaxy. I want you to get all the information for one at least galaxy. So here we are. We you remember this is 1365. You have seen it here. And this is the dust, the gas, and this is observations with ALMA in ESO. And this is JWST, I suppose you all know all about it. And this thing can then tell us, we can actually compare these forms to these forms here and then see what one can get out of it. So we can study the dust lanes in barred galaxies with modern telescopes, both with JWST and with ALMA. Now there's another thing, another little parenthesis to this introduction. And that little parenthesis is that we've got two types of material. There's the baryonic, the baryons, which are stars, the gas, that stuff. And there is another one, which is what we call dark matter. Now, the reason we call it dark matter, we, got, we have, haven't got the foggiest clue yet what it is, but we know that it exists. These are the observations of M31. And we show the velocity curve of uh, the points are the velocities. And here is an exponential disk, what we would have had as a rotation curve. So rotation curve is the rotational velocity as a function of radius. And we will, this thing is what the, would, we would get if it was simply an exponential disk, nothing else. But then so far it was, it was fine, you know, look at it. If, you, if I put my hand on, on this part of the, of the plot, if I, if I rub this out mentally, we see that, oh yeah, well, it fits, not too bad. Why do we need dark matter? Well, we need dark matter because there is gas observations. Gas observations go much, much further out. And you will see, this is the latest of these things. And there, the observed and the calculated are very much apart. While here, what with the error bars and what with that, this and that, we were happy. We didn't need dark matter. Here, we need a lot of dark matter. So these are observations with, from Albert Bosman's thesis. And you see that this, that these, the fact that this was rather flat here is now generalized to many, to a number of galaxies, and they can all be considered nicely flat. So there is dark matter, or then there's different gravity. But if the, the gravity is what we think it is, then this thing has to be flattish. So that's another point. And now we can advance a little bit. And we're going to talk about the stellar, the stars. The stars, of course, we can't um, model each star, star separately, that is, there are so many stars in this ga in galaxies that we can never have enough points in our simulations to to be able to to, to to model those. But it is possible if one particularly um, works in NAS in NASA, then this guy had a lot of CPU time and tried to model a simple two-dimensional 
two-dimensional, like my old uh, bar calculation, bar gas calculations. And he put, this is the initial condition, so he put points on this plane and he let it go. Well, nothing much, nothing much happening. First of all, he started from t equals zero. Ah, by eight, he was starting to get bored, I guess. But then 8.5 and 9 and 9.5. And by then, lo and behold, this is a bar and this is spirals. So this one, he, he did a number of such simulate, not too many, because as I said, even he couldn't find enough time. Um, and therefore, one cannot do too many things, but every time he tried, the bar would appear. So why does the bar appear? And how does it go? And another question, which you might ask in the question time, if you want to, why are not all galaxies barred? We said that this guy took the simulation and found always in all his simulations, he found bars. And why are there not galaxies barred? Because if you remember, this one, for example, is not barred. None of those is barred. Why are those barred? Why are those barred? All these are fascinating things that one can, you know, would like to understand. It's the kind of things that make you not sleep at night. Right, so um, let me skip this part. And now, if we're going to do bars properly, we'd better have a look at orbits because bars are along. If you have a, an, an axisymmetric disk, so here's the, the center of the disk, and you have a star going around. Well, if this is symmetric, axisymmetric, then we, the a circular orbit is a possible orbit because it's the same thing whether you're here or there or there or there. So you've got this simple, very simple uh, orbit. But as soon as you put a bar, even though the disk is axisymmetric, the bar is not axisymmetric. So the, a simple circular orbit would not be possible. So what do we do now? Well, we try and do something else. We will try and put not only angular motion, but also radial motion. So the bar orbit could be like this, could be like this, or whatever you want, but it could be, it has to be non axisymmetric. So here we have two frequencies one which is the frequency around the, the center, which we call omega, and another one which is the in and out. So it was out, in, out, in. So let me take it again. Here's the one motion, and then the other motion is one, out, in, out, in, out. If I'm careful, I can perhaps fiddle around with those things and make it so that the ratio of the frequency of the angular frequency to the, ra to the radial frequency is a, a ratio of two numbers. That is, there is a resonance. So the resonance is, would be something like that in those orbits look elongated. Here I've made it very little elongated so that you see how it goes first thing. But if the bar was stronger, then you wouldn't have this. The bar was stronger, you wouldn't have this, but you would have that. So this would become more elongated. And we call, this is a resonance, and we call it in a Lindblad resonance because simply the person who first worked on it is somebody called Lindblad. There's also um, corrotation resonance, which is this angular velocity is the same with the angular velocity of the bar of itself. And so it corrotates with the bar. So let's look at these things a little bit. Here's a set of those things. 
we have in the center, they're nearly circular, but as you go out, they become more elongated, more elongated, more elongated. And this is a bit, you get less elongated in the outer parts again. So this is the kind of orbits one expects to see, one ex expects to see in barred galaxies. Okay, now there is a rather stiff part, which I will not be able to explain fully, but you will have to believe me that what I tell you is correct. There's nothing much I can do about it, unless you want to stay all overnight and tomorrow and etc. So, so what happens if you've got all those all those orbits, then what happens is if you do it analytically, because there's still analytic work going on in this kind of stuff, then what happens is that the bar can exert a torque. And if the bar exerts a torque, anything that exerts a torque, then it moves angular momentum. That is the way to do it. If you can't move angular momentum with a an axisymmetric thing. It has to be, because the axisymmetric thing doesn't have a torque. So you go to the, th the, uh, the simple case, and then you go to a more complicated case. And then I, th what happens is that this torque takes angular momentum and throws it out to other parts of the galaxy. So the first calculations of these things were Linden Bell and Carl Nice. And they looked at the disk only, and then they saw that indeed angular momentum was thrown from the disk outwards. Then Tremaine and Weinberg continued in this way, and they threw away the disk and said, okay, that's been studied, let's look at something else. And that is the halo. They saw that the angular momentum went to the halo. And later on, quite a long later, I decided that I would look at the two together because they are together, they co coexist in galaxies. So the angular momentum goes from the bar region to the outer disk and the halo. Now this is my biggest finding for that one, for this particular calculation, because the halo, is a very massive thing compared to the outer disk. The disk itself, first of all, is much less massive than the, uh, than, the, than the halo. But the outer disk is even less massive because the mass of the disk is in the center parts. And as you go to the outer parts, then the density drops. So there's hardly anything in the outer parts to receive the angular momentum that was thrown out of the bar region. So, Let me, and now let's try and put, remember we had these angular frequencies and these are the resonances, as we said, and we've got the inner Lindblad resonance, the outer Lindblad resonance, which is a teeny little bit here, the little thing here, I don't know which one of you two you see, but there. And then here we have corrotation. So that is how the resonances go into a disc. Now try and understand, now let, let us try and understand together how the angular momentum is lost by a bar. We, we lose angular momentum from the bar and we throw it to the outer parts. Yes, fine, we throw it and they take it, fine. But how do we, well, how do we change the angular momentum of the inner parts? Well, this is what the, the, um, the, 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 the inner disc would, the disc would look like. And if you lose angular, if you take a, the, the biggest angular momentum you can get is if the orbit is circular. But it, as you make the orbit less and less and less and less circular, then it loses angular momentum. By doing the opposite, if by, well, I take angular momentum from the orbit, then it becomes thin. Same thing for the, the second way of doing that is, is this way. So here we have this, this um, orbits, and outside we have, we assume that we have um, this circular orbits. 
And now, since we're going to lose angular momentum, we're going to lose it from these orbits. These orbits are circular. Now they lose angular momentum, so they become non-circular and they go and sit at the outer, of the bar, outer part of the bar. It's all fine. And we see that there is um, a way of, of getting this angular momentum to the outer parts. And the third, the most simple thing is that the bar rotates slower. Now, this plot is one of my plots, which I'm the most um, happy with. Yes, that's a bit better. So, um, what I have shown is that there is a change in angular momentum and a change in the strength of the bar. And theory, both mine and from other people, the ones I said, named at the beginning, show, uh, find that the stronger the bar, the more angular momentum is redistributed. And now I took all my simulations, every single star you see here is one simulation. So I have a very large number of simulations, as you can see. And these are the, these for every one of them, I read the strength of, I calculate the strength of the bar and I calculate delta LZ in a relative form and plot one point. So one simulation is one value of SB, one value of delta L, L being the angular momentum. And we see that there is indeed a lovely correlation. So what I've been showing with this, my simulations is that indeed there is a very good agreement between the analytic works and the results from simulations. There's a very good agreement here. This shows redistribution of mass and angular momentum with the galaxy. And as the bar loses angular momentum, it will grow stronger and longer and will retire slower. Now, one must be careful because the, the halo should be adequately modeled. It's all very nice to say the halo gets the, the, um, the angular momentum, but it has to be there. So I made two simulations with, two, with the same halo, exactly the same halo. But this, in this case, the halo was given was given was by particles so it's like in any simulation everything was is a sum of particles so here also i will calculate the halo as a sum of particles and here i will not calculate it as a sum of particles i will make it rigid i'm putting i'm putting it simply a, a, an extra force on the equations of motion and you will see that there's a heck of a difference between the two. So the halo should be adequately modeled. It should not be given, um, it should not be given a, a rigid form. It should be allowed to respond to the disk, to respond to the angular momentum it just got. And here's another one, another model, the same thing. I'll skip this one. And we said, remember, this is an, the, the, um, the orbits, which are, um, well, now the bar, major axis of the bar is along like this. And we saw that these are the orbits. And you notice that all orbits are black. It's schematic, huh? it's not much more. All orbits are black, except for one, which is red. And there are further, which I didn't plot, ones here, which are also red. What does it mean? Black means that these are stable orbits. Red means these are unstable orbits. That is, if we have particles on along this orbit, these particles cannot stay there. As the same thing as any unstable thing, for example, my pen, if I let it drop, then I, it will, then I let it like this, it will drop. The same thing, these particles on this thing cannot stay. What do they do? Well, they start moving up and down like this, flop, flop, flop. And then, and then down, 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 down. 
That is done by all particles that are within this red one. And therefore, if I add them, then I will find something. This is the bar. And I find that there's a part which is above the plane of the bar and above the plane of the disk. And that is calculated with these, and that is formed, sorry, with these orbits. Uh, I think I will skip this one. And this is also another model, a simulation of mine, which shows that there is this time, the, this form, remember this form? Here you are. And then there's another part, which is here. And this is an observation, Higgs and whatever. And then you also see this kind of thing. So we see that it is those types of orbits that make this kind of things in the sky. And this orbit here is this thing, this is the same thing, except that instead of seeing the orbit like this, you see it like this. And so this, and this is our own galaxy. Right, I think I'm running out of time. So I'll just show you this little thing here. This is, now I've showed you initially gas, I've showed you, then I showed you stars and dark matter. And now I'm going to put them together because in all galaxies, they are together. So, so here is the, this simulation of the face on view of a bar and the, the outside part. And here it is again, the stars, but here's the older stars. They are older than six giga years. They are your younger stars with age less than six giga years. And this is gas. And this is 15 simulations because we have three different halos and five, but here it's zero, but anyway, there's this one here, and five different um, fractions of gas. So there I have 0% gas, this is all stars, 20% gas, 50% gas, 75% gas, and 100% gas. And so I plot it here because it's 100% gas, because this is where the gas is plotted. And you notice, so this is for the for the old stars and this is the younger stars and let me notice one thing right away this is a similar uh, a, a galaxy then i do every one of them is a, is a simulation right and so what happens here is that this bar which forms from this simulation is strong this bar, which forms from this simulation here, is weak. So I have found one thing like that. The strongest of all bars sit here. The weaker of the whole bars, which probably you can't even see very well, the weakest of all bars are here. What does that mean? That means that the more gas you have, the less the strength of the bar will come. The more gas you have, the, the, the more spheric the, um, the halo is, the stronger the bar. There, the bar is a bit weaker. It is um, the, because the halo is not spherical. So I think this explains how we do it when we've got both gas and stars. And no. so what did we try and touch upon? Well, the bars are the strongest components of the galactic disks. There is other components like the spirals, which we saw, like the rings, which we saw, like all those things. But the strongest components are the, galact are the, uh, are the bars and that's why we start with them. They form naturally due to instabilities 
of the disk component. We saw that the orbit that went like that was not, was not uh, stable and therefore did this and this. And so they form naturally all the different types of orbits come along. The, the bars lead to angular momentum redistribution within the galaxy. They are also vertically unstable and form the box, the peanut and the egg shape. They drive the formation of rings, there are three types of rings. There's a nuclear ring. Um, here we are. The nuclear rings would be up here. The inner rings would be this and the outer rings, well, they're not in this simulations. So we have a nuclear in and an outer rings and spirals. And then the other thing that the dust, the, the gas does, the, sorry, that the bar does is that they feed the monster. The monster is the name of the black hole and everybody's afraid of it. So therefore it's a monster. Now, why can one say that this, this thing have to go very fast back. Yeah, here we are. Remember these plots? Well, there was gas in here. What happens is that the bars is giving a kick to the gas and the gas after a while comes to the center. In the center, it finds this kind of, um, oh, you can't see them this way. No, the, uh, there. So the gas goes inwards here also, the bar goes inwards, the bar goes inwards and collects in this center. Then the bar can go also like, sorry, the, the gas can go all the way here, all the way here, coming to here and there, there's nowhere else to go except the black hole. So what this thing does is to feed the monster. And then there is, of course, one thing. The only thing you, you can say to summarize, I, I, I made a summary here, but it's not a summary because there are so many things about bars. I've been working on them. I can't tell you even how many years they are that I've been working on it. And yet, even though I spent all those years working very hard on those bars, there's one thing I can say for safe, safely. I only know one thing, and that is that I know nothing. And that has not been mine. It's been by Socrates, which, who says, en either or do then either. And I think with that, we st stop. It's an end, but I hope also a beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk and educative talk, I have to say. For all of us who are not working on this topic, it was very, very interesting. Many people are clapping. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> yes, so uh, Despina, would you like to would you like to regulate the discussion now? Uh, sure. Okay. Let me see if there are any questions. Let's see, other than mine, that is. Yeah, I don't see any other hand. So shall I start with a question? Please do. Um, yeah, Ilya, um, you, you showed that um, in, in your almost last slide uh, with the simulations with gas and dust and, and stars, you showed that the strongest bars occur when you have no gas, right? Yes. And you also um, uh, found, I mean, you also claim, I mean, from your simulations that uh, the bar is uh, the one that actually feeds the monster, let's say the black hole. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it feeds it with stars then, because usually, I mean, you say that there's no dust and no gas in these, at least in stronger. Uh, in the cases of strong bars, you have no gas or you have very little gas. So um, do, do, you, do you end up saying that, do you, is, is there 
the final say that you have uh, the feeding of the monster in, the, in intermediate sta stages, let's say, when you have some gas, so you still have some significant bar or something like that. Uh, um, and if that is the case, would that uh, give you some significant results on the, uh, on the statistics of um, AGNs and so on with respect to bar and non bar galaxies and so on and so forth? Right. So the gas is on the right part of this figure. There, this is the gas. It's again got this, uh, this kind of layout. And you can see that there's plenty of it. The reason is that the gas, the, the, the galaxies we know now, the disk galaxies are, have around them hot gas. The halo, there's a halo which is made of hot gas as well as a halo made of dark matter. So that gas is hot, but it, it cools, it cools as it goes down to the center and falls on the disc. So it replenishes the disc. So it's an infalling gas that-, that, that So it's an infalling gas. Now okay. it's also here interesting to think of an other reasons because the, some of it will, as I said, some of it will go to the center from the two sides. You've got along those dust lanes, which are actually gas lanes, and they come to the center together and they fall. And there, there's a big, big concentration. And the concentration of gas is the, is the gas, the gas falls in the center. Great. Now, the, 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 the point is that bars don't like central concentrations. Basic, that's simple to understand. You have, there's your or orbit, right? If the, there was no concentration, then your bar would go, the, the, your orbit would go like this. But now put a very, very, very strong thing. Instead of doing this, it's going to do this. The orbit is going to flock because it turns. If you've got something here, it will go like this. Any, any particle coming along will go like this. So you, you, the bar themselves don't like the, uh, the, the uh, don't like to have a central concentration. So the bar is smaller here when there is this co concentration. Now at this part, they, it fell more, it's a different, this is the bar actually, this is not, it's getting really practically no bar at all. Okay, I think I probably misunderstood what you described um, earlier. Yeah. Okay, I think it's clearer now. Thanks. Um, Luca? Hi, Leah. This is Lucas Lajos. How are you? Yes, the <laughs> Unice. Uh, I had, a, 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 from ignorance, I like this question because, it, as many people said, it was highly educational talk as well. My question is, uh, we have an unknown factor here, and I don't know how you manipulate this, is the dark matter. I mean, yeah. you need dark matter for all these simulations, but how did you play with it? I mean, how did you distribute it? What is the role of the dark matter, which you don't know? How is this unknown factor enters on the whole story? Yeah, good, very good question. Right, um, so for example, let's take this, uh, this case again. I have, if I want to, to get a specific galaxy, I will start by finding its rotation curve. That is, I will find, I will find, um, I, will, I will observe or I will ask my best friend observer to observe for me to get the um, a rotation curve for this galaxy. So this gives me the an a spherically symmetric thing, um, a, a distribution of the of the material of the dark matter. So I have no, I have some constraints at least. I can't put a lot of mass uh, anywhere I want. I they, it has to follow such that the rotation of a circular orbit is given up by this points. 
-hmm. So mm -hmm. okay. I have my, my constraints. I am not finished, right? If that had been all I wanted, I would have been real happy, but it's not the case. There are many other things that I need to try and um, sort out. One of them I've done with, yes, with these three, for example, this one, the, the, oh, can you, yes, here we are. This one is the one that has a spherical halo. This halo is a little bit elongated. This halo is very elongated. All these halos are very elongated. All these halos are spherical. All these halos are intermediate. So I can see that there is some, um, some effect of the halo on the bar. The bar I can observe. So I can play with the halo until I fit a little bit that thing. So there's another point that I have to keep in mind. And there is, well, the last, the third one is really the most difficult one. And is more difficult because it means that when you put stuff in uh, the material in the dark matter halo, you have to give it not only its position, that I more or less can handle, no problem. Well, or little problem, well, let's not say too much. But I can, I have also cases where the thing is not spherical. And that is more difficult because the orbits are very, are much more difficult. Velocity dispersion in, an ex, in a spherical thing is easy to handle. Velocity dispersion in a thing which is like this is not easy to handle. And there we still struggle. Yes. Thank okay. you. Excellent. I, it's about 12 years ago I tried that first time, and I still don't have an answer. I'm not doing it full time, huh? but uh, <laughs> uh, it, I've, I've had ideas. They didn't work. I tried another yeah. one. It didn't work. So on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We all do the same. I mean, otherwise, there will not have been science. Thank you very much. It was an excellent talk. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, any other question from the audience? Please speak up because I may be missing some something. Uh, I don't see any other. Uh, can, I, can I get back to the previous question, Nalia? Because I think there is a paper, or at least, at least one paper that came out last year showing that um, uh, the barred galaxies are more likely to be AGMs and they have higher accretion rates than unbarred galaxies. Uh -huh. So does that go along with what you've shown us here? Well, if we take what I said for granted, if we take all those things, then as we said, the black hole is in the center. And the more you cram gas into the black hole, the more chances you have to have it. I mean, the, the stronger the age. Yeah, of course, yeah, 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 but yeah. So in that sense, yes, but I'm not so sure even if the results are 100% sure, I mean, about how bars and AGN couple to each other. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not even sure. I'm, I, I, it was a, I know that there's at least five or six papers and each one says, oh, well, it's not like the previous paper. Listen to this paper. And so you read the paper. Yeah. And after a while, you have to look at another paper. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's true. And they have various ifs uh, in there, which are not very clear. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Leah. That was a great talk, as usual. <laughs> very you. interesting. Thank you, thank you. Uh, can I, let me just check if there's any, any other question. Please speak up if I'm missing someone's hand. Don't see anything. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and hope to see all of you again some other time. Sure. We'll, we'll hope to see, hopefully we'll see you in Athens or at an... Uh, yes, I might meeting. be coming in Athens in um, oh, autumn. 
I'd say. Okay. Yeah. So maybe maybe you can come over to the university for, for a visit. Yeah. That would be with a great pleasure. Yeah. I'll let you know so you see. Great. What. Yeah, that would be lovely. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Thanks. Thank Bye. you. And this was our last. Yes. Was this the last meeting? Yes. <laughs> ah.